This is a reading from TSL. Neither plenitude nor vacancy, only a flicker over time ridden faces, distracted by distraction, by distraction, filled with fancies and empty of meaning, tumid apathy with no concentration, men and bits of paper whirled by the cold wind that blows before and after time. Wind in and wind out of unwholesome lungs, time before and time after. Eruption of unhealthy souls into the faded air. The torpid driven on the wind that sweeps the gloomy hills of London, Hampstead and Clerkenwell, Camden and Putney, Highgate, Primrose and Ludgate, not here, not here in the darkness in this twittering world. Today we begin a four-week sermon series that I hope will also prepare us for the season of Lent that follows. If you have read in the newsletter, you know that my dearest of friends is a United Methodist pastor, Mary Kay Toddy. And she is in a Doctor of Ministry degree at Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C., a program that I am envious of. It is an arts and theology program. So she has been doing lots of fun things with art uh, for the last few years. And one of her projects was to create um, something liturgical, something worshipful uh, in relation to the arts. So she chose the poetry of T.S. Eliot in his book, Four Quartets, a series of four poems that we'll look at over the next few weeks. I will note that some of the liturgy that you have read today, the call to worship and the prayer, was written by her also uh, in keeping with this. And uh, she is looking for feedback uh, on the themes and the concept. Uh, we also began a study series, a very light and casual one, uh, before worship at 9.30 each of the next three weeks. So, having said that, let's have a word of prayer. Oh, gracious God, we surely do pray that the words of my mouth, the poetry of T.S. Eliot, and the meditations of all of our hearts might be acceptable to you, O oh God, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Just in case you missed the cover of Time magazine, you will need to know that apparently 2014 has been named the Year of Mindfulness. I'm not sure if the good editors at Time magazine were the ones who decided this or if there is some larger, greater spiritual body that gets to decide that 2014 is the year of mindfulness, but it is. And if you haven't begun working on your mindfulness, you better get cracking. We have 11 months to go and not even that. So start your mindfulness now. I'm joking, of course. I think it is always humorous when ancient practices and rituals become hip and trendy again. Mindfulness is just another fancy word for contemplative prayer and meditation. The Hebrew and Christian scriptures are filled with examples of mindfulness. Sometimes people doing it well, and sometimes people doing it not so well. From, of course, the preeminent example would be Jesus Christ, whose life was a mindful life, a contemplative life, a life that was filled with, with thoughtful meaning. From his heading out into the wilderness before his ministry even began, to his taking a handful of disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane the night he would be betrayed, the day before he would be crucified. Jesus understood that the best way to deal with the whirlwind and chaos of our world was to steal away and find that quiet center. 
He didn't always get to do it like he wanted to, if you know scripture well, but he still gave us the image. Besides the fact that our culture likes trends, fads, and anything hip, there is something to be said for a greater need for mindfulness in the modern age. Especially in a technologically inundated world like ours. Oh, excuse me. I think I have a phone call. Oh, no, no. Someone just tweeted me. I don't know, Jake, whether or not uh, we should record poetry reading, but uh, if you feel like doing it next time, that's fine with me. Um, there might be more of a need for, by the way, thank you for the great sermon illustration. Um, there might be more of a need for mindfulness in our modern age because of technology. I think there's always been a need to be centered and prayerful, but there are more distractions literally at our fingertips now. Literally, the, literally. The world is at our fingertips in a technological way. Anne Mack, who apparently is a trend spotter out in the world, noted this. She said that mindful living has staying power because our world is only going to become more saturated with technology. And therefore, people have to find ways to counteract that. We're reassessing our relationship with technology. Over the last decade, we've allowed technology to rule us. Now, we're trying to be more mindful of the way we use technology to find a balance. No one knows this more than I do, my beloved congregation, social media and technology buff that I am. It is very hard to be mindful of just one thing just one thing when you can Google anything in a second. But poet T.S. Eliot nonetheless captured the timeless human struggle for mindfulness over 70 years ago in a much less technologically driven but nonetheless distracted society. When he wrote, Distracted from distraction by distraction, filled with fancies and empty meaning, tumid apathy with no concentration, men and bits of paper whirled by the cold wind that blows before and after time. Not here. Not here, the darkness in this twittering world. How prophetic could he have been when we now literally are a tweeting world? Whatever our distractions that distract us by distracting, whether it is our obsession with love, loss, or family deep in need, whether it's worries about work or health or politics, whether it's the agitation that comes from too much twittering technology, too close and too tempting, our anxieties can get the best of us and make our days long and our nights exhausting. I dare say there is not one person among us, whether you have a smartphone or not, there is not one person among us who does not long for more moments of peace. A better way to focus on what's important. A sense of groundedness that gives you confidence for the day. So that in the words of the great mystic Julian of Norwich, we can say, all shall be well. All shall be well. And all manner of things shall be well. Don't we all long for that feeling? Eliot expresses our yearning so well. He describes what we're longing for by writing, The inner freedom from the practical desire, the release <coughs> from action and 
suffering. Release from the inner and the outer compulsion. Yet surrounded by a grace of sense, a white light still and moving, both a new world and the old made explicit and understood in the completion of partial ecstasy and the resolution of its partial horror. What an exquisite call to freedom, to release, to grace, the coming together of old and new, the fulfillment of ecstasy, and the letting go of horror. If I could step back from my pastorly role and just look at this from a purely non-spiritual standpoint, mindfulness has proven to be a very effective thing in our life to make our lives better, to give us very tangible and real benefits. Recent studies have shown, actually studies for years, that mindfulness provides emotional stability. Mindfulness improves our sleep. Mindfulness does increase our focus and even our memory. It enhances creativity and it lowers stress levels. And those are just a few of the health benefits that comes from this ancient practice of contemplative prayer, meditation, mindfulness. But you and I know there is more than just this very biological, pragmatic reason why we want to be about mindfulness. It's more than just lowering our blood pressure trying to find more time in our REM sleep phase. We know that to be deeply and profoundly aware of life, including ourselves, is to be more and deeply aware of the divine, of God. The more we are conscious in every given moment of who we are and what is going on in and around us, the more we are aware that God is alive and active and God created us to thrive and to flourish it is really hard to do that when we are distracted and anxious all the time I don't have to tell you that you all know that I know that the ancient poet knew it and that poet sang the truth that all of us find when we are deep in meditation filled by contemplative prayer fully mindful. God is our refuge, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumults, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the dawn arises. And then those words that echo through prayers centuries and millennia old, be still and know that I am God. The psalmist helps us. The answer has been there all along. When we question how, how do we do this? How do we become more mindful? How do we become more centered? How do we push away the distractions? How do we become more spiritually aware? Well, we think first we have to get away from it all. Well, we have to immerse ourselves in nature. And Eliot uses the beautiful imagery in this particular poem about a deserted garden in the outskirts of London that he has found with birds twittering and, and, and flowers living and growing and dying there. But the psalmist says, no, not necessarily. It's not necessarily about place. 
Because the psalmist says God can be found in the city also. So then we think maybe we need to be secure. We need to, to fortify ourselves. We need to, to get our defenses up so that we can kind of retreat back safely. The psalmist says, no, no, it's, it's not really about being secure. You, you can be mindful and be very vulnerable because it is God who is the one who breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shield with fire. Not us. So, so how do we trust that God is our refuge and strength? The answer is as challenging as it is simple. Be still. Stop what you're doing. And know that God is God. The voice says to us when we slow down enough to hear it, be still. The secret to being mindful, to countering the effects of anxiety and distraction and compulsion, doesn't lie in some newfangled technique or the latest guru, although they might help. It's not going to go away by turning on the television set 24-7 so you've got something going on. Finding inner peace doesn't require you to go here or to leave there. The psalmist, and indeed Jesus says, it's just to be something you are already doing. We don't have to even be God. That job is taken. We just have to be ourselves. The greatest spiritual challenge is the one most easily accomplished. My mother taught me this. No, she was not the model of tranquility. I know those moments of great anxiety when the bills couldn't be paid and when my brother was out too late. She was not the model of tranquility by any means. But when she entered the doors of the hospital where she was a nurse, when she walked the halls of the nursing home where she was the executive director, you could almost see scales fall from her very body. And she would talk about and with the patients and the residents in the most amazing and centered way. If they could chat with her, my mother was fully present with them, talking about whatever they needed to talk about. And if they could not say a word, whether it was because of a stroke or because of a coma or just because of advanced Alzheimer's, whatever the case, she still walked into that room as centered and focused on who they were as a human being. And you know what? Every single one of them gave that gift back to my mother. Even the ones who never moved a muscle or said a word gave the gift of being. The greatest gift we can give anyone is to be ourselves. I saw Jesus Christ in the way my mother treated her patients, and this gave them, her, and me great serenity. Let's make a promise to each other, shall we? Let's not only make 2014 the year of mindfulness, let's pledge to make the rest of our lives the life of mindfulness. Grounded in the knowledge of God's creating love, Christ's redeeming love, and the Holy Spirit's empowering love, let us simply be and allow others the grace to be also. So let me end with two very practical suggestions. There's lots of places in this church where we try to be. In this worship service, the elders always begin with a time of centering and prayer. Our Bible study on Wednesday nights always has prayer beginning and end. But there's a group that meets downstairs in the parlor, led by Joan McGuire, who has got to be one of the most centered human beings I've ever known in my life. And they do yoga. When I walk into that room when they are finished, I feel as if 
There is a vortex of peace and love. They've just spent an hour doing nothing more than be. They meet on Mondays at 5.30 and Wednesdays at 6. I know they would love to have me. And I'm so excited to tell you that St. John's Episcopal Church just down the street that has been closed as a worshiping congregation for years. Well, they're putting new investment into it and rethinking it, not as another community of faith like ours, but as a, a building that serves its community. And on Wednesday nights, they have a Teze service. Teze is this wonderful ancient practice of, of singing and prayer and meditation that is very centering. I've got information about that on the bulletin board just outside the door. So, whatever you choose to do, however you choose to Keep up your end of the bargain to be mindful the rest of your life. Let us all celebrate that God has already said to us, be still, be. Amen.